Hello, everybody. I hope everybody is in place and we can start now. Welcome, welcome, and bienvenue. I am absolutely delighted to be your host for this international ETC conference. My name is Annette Gerlach. I'm a journalist for the French German broadcast. Um, theater wise, just to give you a frame, I grew up with pieces from these wonderful directors like Peter Stein, Klaus Michael Gruber, or Patrice Chéreau. And in the more recent time, of course, Thomas Ostermeyer or Falk Richter, because I'm a Berliner living in France. But I know this were all men. Our topic today has no time or gender limits. We have two hours to talk about ways and opportunities for the theater to go green. As you all know, the European Theater Convention is the largest network of public theaters. More than 30 members are joining us today and we're absolutely thrilled to have you all here this morning. Definitely not a theater hour, 10 o'clock in the morning. And you're joining us from 28 countries. What a public. This is the second international theater conference to take place online. And we are really keen to open up the format. Uh, by the way, to reach out a larger public, of course, the online format is great. But I think we all agree that we would rather prefer to meet in a wonderful theater theater location and see us really and in live. And by the way, you will meet the wonderful people from the Hungarian theater where this meeting was originally planned a little bit later. Our discussion can be followed on this ETC uh, Zoom uh, platform for the ETC members and for a wider audience on the whole round theater Commons website and on the ETC Facebook channel. You will find the link in the chat. Today's program, let's be totally clear, is just a beginning, a mark to start a long-term focus on the topic of sustain sustainability and green theater at the ATC. This is not a sprint, this is a marathon we are starting today. I'm curious and eager to discuss with experts in environmental protection and people from the theater field to share their experience and good ideas how theaters can go green. And you, please, dear public, you are very much invited to be also a part of the discussion. You can write your questions in the Zoom chat with the Q&R button or the comments, comments in the live streamed video on Facebook. It's up to you, but please give your input. You can start right now. We will make a little selection of all of this and we will try to give a um, feedback of your input a little bit later this morning. Without further ado, let me right now introduce you to the executive director of ETC, Heidi Wiley, and the president of the ETC board and general manager of the Theatre de Liège in Belgium, Serge Rangoni. Heidi, ladies first. Thank you very much, Annette. Well, you know, um, the pandemic has shown from one day to another, it's possible to shut down all theatres to stop all of our activities and to stop international collaboration in Europe the way we knew it. And not only in Europe, around the world. So what will be the consequences and lessons that we will draw from uh, this situation when designing the next decade for international theater collaborations in the ETC Europe's network for theaters? Well, in other words, if our raison d'être can be taken away from one day to another, it's very important to have a political voice in today's society, to remain visible, first of all, to remain relevant, and also to be sustained, both on national, but also very much on a European level. We know theater is fundamental for society, but beyond entertainment, it also has a strong educational purpose, provoking our thoughts, our critical thinking, and our social dialogue. And discussions in the last months about systemic relevance of our sectors in society have demonstrated it's not only important that we live, but also how we live. And the longer the virus stays with us, we have to make sure that theatre still plays a vital part for this letter quality. So for us in ETC, designing the next decade is first about surviving the pandemic as a sector. And second, it's to continue playing an important role in society, bridging with theatres across borders, cultures and languages to bring different perspectives in our communities with an increased support and recognition needed to sustain our sector. 
So to summarize, the most important lesson so far for us was that we um, learned it will be actually uh, not the way um, it used to be before. It's become quite a common consensus that after COVID-19, we won't go back to life as it was before. And ETC will remain committed to championing justice, democracy, and cultural collaboration through theater. And our work will be based on the three principles of a more sustainable, a more diverse, and digital use of our resources to create, present, and share theater made in Europe. Sustainable will be crucial for all of our actions, for our working methods, our business models, our way of creating international theater collaboration. And it was also one of the key subjects dealt with in the recent European Theatre Forum. In other words, it's a natural progression for us to make also environmental protection central to our strategic development. And therefore, like Annette said, it's the beginning of a marathon uh, that we are now undertaking, uh, like everyone else in society. And I'm very delighted that we will be joined today by various experts to learn from each other, share knowledge, and start the process of sustainable transformation. So thank you so much, Heidi. Well, well said. Serge, up to you to give us a little insight. So you are the theater, you're not only the president of the ETC board, but you're also the general manager of the Théâtre de Liège in Belgium. So what efforts have been made, for example, in Belgium or around your theater on this long way to go green? Unfortunately, not a lot. <laughs> we we <laughs> confess. Um, because for different reasons. Uh, because the system of theater uh, need obviously to have new performances, new productions to do, uh, and so on. So it's very difficult to change the process uh, of making theater. On the other hand, um, the building, I have uh, 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 the pleasure to be in a new build, build building uh, in, uh, in uh, 13 and nothing has been made to uh, uh, climate control and, uh, and so on. Nothing has been made. Why? Because in, and in most uh, of the European countries, it's the same situation because the public support goes to individuals, houses, but the public buildings, it's very, it's very rarely uh, thought because it costs, the costs are higher and so uh, nothing has been made. So uh, the only, probably the only field in which we see that the topic of a climate change are really taken uh, is on the, on the stage by artists, but sometimes with some contradiction because you have some artists who are speaking about um, uh, climate changing, but you need three trucks to, to do the performances. So sometimes it's a little bit uh, difficult. I think in this moment now, because we are stopped for a long time, we have a moment to reflect and to act and to see where there are good examples uh, that we can learn and reproduce and probably go further. I think this is really uh, something that we have to do now. And uh, it's the reason why with ETC, uh, we, we were, all of us, we agreed already before, but more today, uh, really to, to share this, these questions and to find ways to be better uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Thank you very much, Serge. And yes, it is a kind of momentum we have to take advantage of right now. Theaters are unfortunately empty, there is no, so let's take this time to make a good reflection about the next decade and how we can design the future. Um, as you all know, the ETC International Theatre Conference should have taken place in Hungary, hosted by the theatre in Sombatai, one of the eldest Hungarian cities situated near to the uh, Austrian border. 
Hungary is, as we all know, a country where free expression and artistic expression speci specifically uh, is, I would say, under attack right now in the present time and with the politics of Viktor Orban. So we regret even more that we could not come and support with in person the Hungarian theater scene. Um, and it is really, it's, it's, a, it's an unfortunately thing due, of course, to the pandemic. But instead of being with them in their countries, they have prepared something to send greetings to us. And now comes the big challenge for me today. I have to pronounce the name of this Hungarian theater. I um, tried, so it is. Please welcome the contribution of Vörös Sándor Sinház. Sziasztok, szeretettel köszöntelek titeket a Vörös Sándor Színházban. A pandémiás helyzet egy eléggé furcsa helyzet elé állított bennünket. Ennél környezetbarátabb és fenntarthatóbb konferenciát nem tudnánk tartani, mint hogy nincsen utazás, nem fogyasztunk különösebben áramot, mert előadásokat sem tudunk játszani a színházban, sőt, átmenetőleg a próbákat is le kellett állítani, úgyhogy gyakorlatilag jelen pillanatban a színház alapjáraton üzemel csak. Megérkeztünk az aulába, itt tartottuk volna számotokra a fogadást, amelyre szeretettel vártunk titeket. Hát sajnos most ez is elmarad, egy kicsit pang mostanában, hiszen egy jó ideje nincsenek előadások a színházban, és úgy tűnik, hogy ez legalább december közepéig így is marad, már félünk attól, hogy akár februárig is elhúzódhat ez a helyzet. Szeretettel és tisztelettel köszöntöm Szerzs Ranzsonyi urat, az ETC elnökét, az elnökségi tagokat, valamint minden kedves kollégát, barátot, ismerőst, voltak éppen mindenkit, aki most hall engem. Jordán Tamás vagyok, a Szombathelyi Vörös Sándor Színház igazgatója még néhány hónapig. Rendkívül sajnáltuk, hogy elmarad a Covid járvány miatt ez a konferencia, mert a színházunk most kezdett igazán beépülni a magyar színházi életbe. Egyre jelentősebb a szerepünk, és ez a konferencia biztos, hogy nagyon nagy presztist hozott volna nekünk, és reméltem, hogy ez a konferencia ez szakmai tapasztalatokat is jelent majd, aminek segítségével még gazdagabban működünk. A színház az elpusztíthatatlan, mert a színház az igény, az nem szűnik meg. Az elképzelhető, hogy egyes intézmények, műhelyek bizonyos okokból megszűnnek létezni, de ettől ez a fogalom, hogy színház, ez kitörölhetetlen. Akkor fenntartható egy színház, hogyha a működésének anyagi feltételei megvan. Természetesen nagyon sok függ attól, hogy a színház hogy működik, hány nézőt tud behozni, mennyi bevételt tud csinálni. És egy vidéki színháznak meg kell gondolnia azt, hogy milyen műsortervet készít, mert a város közönsége az sokféle ízléssel is igényel megy a színházba. A fenntarthatóság egyik fontos eleme, hogy a jövő közönsége milyen lesz. 
nem tudunk eleget foglalkozni a fiatalokkal, már óvodáskorban, de később, amikor már hat évesek elmúlnak, akkor is kell olyan kínálattal rendelkeznünk, amelyik a gyerekeket színházra szoktatja. Tehát a színházi nevelés az a fenntartató működésnek egyik alappillére. Fontos szempont a további működésekhez az, hogy a színházban dolgozók érezzék azt, hogy a társadalomban ők nagyon fontos szerepet töltenek be. A hivatásnak teljesen odaadóan egész életüket és lényüket beleadva dolgozzanak. A színház jövője nagy mértékben függ attól, hogy a színházban alkotó művészek önálló elképzeléssel és igazán szignifikáns művészi törekvésekkel dolgozzanak. Ami a Szombathely városát és benne a Vörös Sándor színházat illeti, én remélem, hogy mi nem sokára már jelentős tényezői leszünk az európai összínházi életnek. Köszönöm szépen, hogy meghallgattak. Megérkeztünk a nagy színpadra. Itt játszódna Karadzsále a Farsang című produkciónk, amelyet november 29-én akartunk a bemutatókor megmutatni nektek. Sajnos erre most nincs lehetőségünk, mint látjátok, még díszletünk sincsen, bár az hamarosan érkezik, de egyelőre színészünk sincs, aki dolgoznak színpadon, hiszen mindenki karanténban van egy sajnálatos Covid-fertőzés gyanúja miatt. Színház kamaratermét szombathely szülöttjéről Márkus Emiliáról nevezték el. Éppen az Eghúz díszlete áll a színpadon, amely egy balsósú előadás, hiszen februári bemutatója óta négyszer kellett már megszakítani a bérletes sorozatunkat. Mondhatjuk, hogy öröm az örömben, hogy a modern technika segítségével a szín az YouTube csatornáján fogják megtekinteni az elmaradt előadásokat a bérleteseink. Ahogy tették ezt a lezárás előtti utolsó napon a kis hogy a Maximból, előadással, amelyet élőben tekinthettek meg a Youtube-on. Tisztelettel köszöntöm a konferencia résztvevőit! Remény András vagyok, Szombathely Megyeugú város polgármestere. Azért a városé, amelyet a jövő városának szoktunk hívni. A jövő pedig zöld, fenntartható és a közösségek városa. Szombathelyt egy olyan városnak képzeljük el, ahol a korszerű tömegközlekedésen keresztül lehet eljutni a munkahelyekre, ahol jó a levegő, ahol az egyes munkahelyeken a közösségek pontosan tudják, hogy miért kell védeni, vigyázni a városunkra. A színház maga egy közösség. A színháznak szerintem az egyik feladata az, hogy közvetítse a színházba járók, az itt élők, a szombathelyek számára, hogy miért fontos, hogy elkötezettek legyenek a jövő irányában. Hogy alkossanak maguk is egy újabb közösséget, hogy vigyázzanak a játszóterekre, vigyázzanak a parkokra, vigyázzanak a város levegőjére. Sok segítséget tudunk kapni a színháztól és valamennyi kulturális intézményünktől. Én azt remélem ettől a konferenciától, hogy maguk a résztvegők további impulzusokat tudnak majd kapni, és amikor ezeket megkapják, akkor visszacsatolják a saját városukba. Hogy aztán a következő 2, 3, 4, 5, vagy talán még annál több évben is tudjuk valamennyien használni a nagy közösség, a város és a még sokkal nagyobb közösség az ország, és akár mondhatom egész Európa, az egész Föld javára. Így lesz a kicsiből valami igazán nagy és nagyszerű. Ehhez kívánok mindenkinek jó tanácskozást, jó konferenciát, jó egészséget! Kedves kollégák, hölgyeim és uraim, tisztelettel és szeretettel köszöntöm a konferencia minden résztvevőjét. Szabó Tibor vagyok, és 2021. február 1-től 
Én veszem át Jordán Tamástól a Szombathelyi Vörös Sándor Színház ügyvezetésével, irányításával járó feladatokat. Megmondom őszintén, hogy nehezemre esik úgy beszélgetni, hogy közben csak egy kamera rideg optikáját látom, abba kell beleméznem, és nem látom a beszélgető partnereknek az arcát, arcának rezüléseit, és nem tudok belenézni a szemükbe. Eszembe jutnak azok a kollégák, akiknek például nincsen olyan védőernyő a fejük fölött ezekben a pandémiás időkben, ami a megélhetésüket biztosítja. És azt gondolom, hogy talán ennek a konferenciának lehet egy olyan témája is, vagy, vagy eredménye, hogy gondolunk azokra, és akik nagyon nehéz helyzetbe jöttek, kerültek a vírus helyzet miatt, és pizzafutárként, vagy pedig eladóként, vagy pedig bármilyen egyéb hát a művészetüktől, a foglalkozás körüktől távol álló tevékenységgel kell fenntartaniuk magukat és a családjukat. Én nagyon remélem, és bízom abban, hogy ez a vírus helyzet előbb-utóbb elmúlik, a világ felülkerekedik, és mi legyőzzük, és ahhoz kívánok mindannyiuknak hát, kitartást, jó egészséget, és kifejezem azt a reményemet, hogy előbb-utóbb személyesen is találkozni tudunk. Eredményes munkát is kívánok mindannyiuknak. What a great little film. Thank you so much for the team of the Verre Sandor Sinhade Theater in Sombatai, and especially to the mayor, Andres Nemine, and the actual director, Thomas Jordan, and also, of course, the new director. Right now, to get us some perspective and to have a better understanding of the challenges and issues of sustainability and the reality of it, uh, I'm very honored to present you our keynote speaker. He is the president of NABU. This means Nature and Biodiversity Conservation Union, founded in 1899 and so for one of the oldest and largest environment associations in Germany with more than 700,000 members. So our speaker will give us an overall context and a pragmatic, realistic outlook to our main topic today. Jörg Andreas Krüger, the floor is yours. So hello again from my side. I had to switch on my microphone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And let me say that I'm really happy to be here today and to be part of your discussion about more sustainability uh, across Europe in the European theaters. Um, let, me, let me give some more uh, information about our organization. Annette Gerlach just mentioned that we are a very old organization, that we have a lot of members, but what we are really proud about is that we have more than 70,000 volunteers working in our German local groups, working for the preservation of habitats and ecosystems, for protected areas, for more sustainable production and consumption schemes, and trying to, to be a change agent Uh, so that we can come forward in our society discussions uh, with regard to climate change and biodiversity loss. In the last minutes of the, the film from the Hungarian colleagues, we heard a lot about um, social responsibility. And I mean, for sure, I will focus now in the, in the, in the upcoming minutes a little bit more about uh, on, on the topic of ecologic uh, sustainability. But we are completely aware, and I just want to underline that at the very beginning of my keynote, that there is no way 
to ecologic sustainability and an uh, ecologic sustainable society without social society, uh, so social sustainability in the society as well. So we always have to bring that together and we can't say, okay, at the moment is what, one thing is prior, more prior than the other. We always have to bring it together. And with that, I just wanna start with a few thoughts and impressions about the global ecological crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. I think I don't have to go too much into detail uh, with regard to climate change. We all have heard the uh, very often in the news. We know and discuss that in our society sometimes for more than 20 years. And we all have heard about the two degrees which we want to have as a as a maximum temperature rise in this century. Um, that is agreed by all heads of state uh, in 2015 in Paris, in the so-called Paris Agreement. But the truth is at the moment that we are on the way to 2.9, 3.0 degrees uh, temperature rise, and that will harm our ecosystems, our economy, our social systems in a really deep way. We all have used, uh, have been, um, become used to the, to, the, to the pictures of forest fires ar uh, around the globe in Australia and Siberia, in the uh, Congo Basin, in the Amazon. We, we have the same in parts of Europe. We have seen the floods, we have seen the droughts, and we have seen the first ecosystem starting dying. In Germany, we have, uh, at the moment, we have around 300,000 hectares of forests which collapsed under the drought and under the heat in the summers uh, of the last two and three years. And that's what we have to expect for the future as well. And that is the link to the a little bit more invisible um, ecological crisis, the loss of biodiversity. And at the beginning, I want to clarify one very common misunderstanding. Many, in many discussions, people come to me and say, okay, biodiversity, ah, you mean you want to protect species, but that's not the case. Biodiversity is, is meant as the variety of life on earth. That is, the, these are genes, these are species, and that's the variety of ecosystems. And these ecosystems provide us with ecosystem services like fresh air, like um, drinking water in good quality, like fertile soil, and so on and so on and so on. And so if we speak about the loss of biodiversity, it's not just the tiger, it's not just the white stork or the gorilla, it is the fundament of our economies and the fundament of our societies, which we are talking about. And how big the problem is, especially here in Germany, I can give you this one example. We lost over the last 25 to 30 years, almost 75 to 80% of the biomass of flying insects. So not the, 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 the white stock, not the tiger again, but you can imagine that these insects, which we need for, uh, for pollination, which we, which we need for a lot of other ecosystem connections, uh, that we are missing these insects and we have now to, to, to live in these limited ecosystems with a limited capacity for ecosystem services. And that's where we have to work on. The, International Biodiversity Council came up last year with a large report and they said, okay, we have uh, two or three different but major causes for this biodiversity loss. First is land use change. And these land use changes very often coming up from things like palm oil or soy production. So in Indonesia or in, in uh, South, uh, South America. And that is the direct link to our lifestyle, to our meat consumption, to our energy system, and uh, all the uh, systems and products where we use palm oil. The second thing for biodiversity is climate change. There is an interlink between the two crises for sure. I mean, when there is no rain anymore, then a wetland becomes dry and there is no wetland ecosystem services any, service anymore. That's very obvious, I guess. And the third thing is the direct over exploitation of um, fish in the, in the marine, of uh, timber in the forests and of other things. And then there are a few minor uh, causes as well, but these three are the main things where we have to, 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 to work on. And when we compare, or if we compare the, the, the results which we have to expect from these crises, um, when we compare that to the COVID-19 situation which we have at the moment, then we have seen this year, 
that the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis has affected our economies, our parliaments, our public budgets, our private lives and changed everything fundamentally. And that is what we will see when we don't act against climate change, when we are not able to, to reduce and limit climate change below two degrees. Since then, uh, we will see some tipping, tipping points in the ecosystems and a complete new ecosystem, um, complete, new, complete new ecosystem landscape will, will come up with a lot of uh, other services, maybe, but uh, with many, many services are missing for our future, which we have used for, for the last uh, centuries. The COVID-19 crisis for me is as well an example, and that's a link to the social sustainability as well, that um, the, the pandemic is hitting the weakest members of our societies and the poorest countries around the globe very hard, harder than others. And that's the same what we will see with um, climate change and biodiversity loss. Since most of us in Europe, we are um, not really depending directly on freshwater supply from, from a river or from uh, firewood uh, supply from a forest, but many, many people around the globe, they are in this situation that they have to use these direct ecosystem services. And we should be aware that if we are talking about ecological sustainability and uh, combating and fighting against these two crises, we, we help these 800 to 900 million people who live from the services directly. So it's time to act, I guess, uh, I guess there is no doubt about that. And I have two good news. First thing is, we pretty good know what we have to do and what we have, what we should do. And we know that since the beginning of the 90s, and there are tons of papers, scientific, scientific expertise, and some best practices, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the heads of state came to, states came together in 2015, and they brought most of the things together in the Sustainable Development Goals. You all know there are these 17 goals which describe how we can create a good future for all of us. And the, the, the mission statement is leaving no one behind, not in our societies and not in the other societies of the Global South as well. The 2015 Sustainable Development Goals are a kind of pathway for, for the transformation of our way to, to act, to produce, to consume and to live. And my second good point is, that transformation is just a big, very, very big word, and you really feel the pressure on, on the shoulders then. But transformation starts with small steps as well. So we always, and everybody has in the private life, and if each, uh, each theater will have an entry point into the sustainability discussion and can start with smaller steps, can be more familiar with the topics, and can then uh, go deeper into the details. The roads towards the sustainability of a theater, they are so different as the situations in the theaters are uh, in, the, in the real life situation. So what, what can you do as um, the theaters in, in, in Europe? I think mm, the first point is to, to check your, um, your, um, your house for some resource saving measures. I mean, that's something what you mostly have already done um, for, the, um, for, for efficiency reasons and to save some money. But so we are talking about energy saving lamps. We are talking about the flushing of the toilets, but we are talking as well about the temperature of the warm water in the house. And for sure, we are talking about the insulation of the building and for the, of, about new heating systems. These, the last two are the really transformational big big things, but uh, yeah, we are completely aware that you uh, and we all need a lot of money for that. But the good news is that with the European Green Deal, there is a lot of money for investment, investment in uh, climate change mitigation measures from the European Union and in many, many of the national recovery plans as well. And uh, I think it's something where we can go together as theorists and NGOs and lobby for direct uh, money for direct support of the theaters. The second thing, and that is a little bit more complex, is check your procurement policies. So source renewable energy. 
So uh, get your electricity from wind farms and uh, from photovoltaic farms. So that is that you step out of the fossil energies and the CO2 driven energy supply. And next points are print your programs on recycling materials, recycling paper, use local products in the canteen and please don't sell uh, water which we, which you can sometimes see in theaters and in other places uh, water from some glacier or, or some remote islands since it's posh no just sell the, the 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 water from the local water provider maybe directly from the tap or bottled uh, with a little bit of uh, gas then for for the comfort Third thing is something what I guess you have sometimes done already in your core business, and that is design costumes and stage props for reuse and recycling. We, we at the moment, we are using um, the resources of almost two planets per year. That means we use so much timber, so much fish, so much um, uh, meadows and so on and so on. And um, we, we use uh, the, the doubled amount of the, the renewable capacity of the, of the planet at the moment. And that is uh, like with, with a private bank account. If you always go uh, and uh, spend more with, uh, than you have, then you are sometimes, uh, someday you will have a big, big problem. And so let's get rid of this and start thinking about reusing things and recycling things. And that means don't combine materials together, which you can't separate anymore, uh, make them easy to repair the things and so on and so on. So coming from these um, things which are very close to your core business, core business, core business we can discuss as well about, um, have you thought about giving biodiversity a space around your house? I mean, some, some of the theaters have uh, small gardens, small parks, others will have some, um, some space on the roof or some, some, something else. We have a wonderful example here in Berlin, the Deutsche the, 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 in front of the German theater, the, the Deutsche Theater, we have some areas with wildflowers and it's really like a paradise. And you can see people come there and they enjoy that, that, that biodiversity, that there are insects, that there, there is life, in the city center of Berlin. That is something what is good for communication of sustainability aspects as well. And then think about developing your own sustainability strategy and involve your staff and maybe cooperate with a local environmental group. These local environmentalists, they can give, um, they can give expertise, they can help you, they can act together with your staff. So make it a thing which is not just the management approach of the theater, make it a thing for everybody who's working in the theater. And uh, the, the third thing, that's something what I mentioned before is let us lobby together for a good legal frame and for a good funding frame so that the theaters can become a sustainable place. You, you, you all know better than I do uh, how big is the role of theaters as a change agent and as a facilitator of society discussions. We have seen that so often in European history. And my hope is that we can find a way that European theaters become a change agent and facilitator for these sustainability discussions as well. So please give, give this sustainable future a place in your houses on stage, involve the community of your guests, of your staff, reach out into the society and at the end walk the talk. So make your houses as sustainable as it's, it's, it's possible. And I hope that this day today is just the start of a discussion. And we from NABU, we are really looking forward to cooperate with you and uh, with many others with our European network partners and other European countries. So thank you very much. And I hope we will now have a very good discussion. Thank you so much, Jörg Andreas. I love your, your terms, change agent. I think immediately about a green 007 for theaters. Um, just <laughs> let me ask you one more. You already, already gave us a lot of very concrete recommendations and we will talk about this especially we have some examples to so go directly in your idea uh, before we meet the other panelists i would like that you go a bit further on this role theater has in society because theater has this incredible strength of impacting things now i'm not talking about the transformation of the building but more what's going on on, on, on scene 
the pieces that cho chosen, etc. Um, would you have an advice or an idea what could be on, on scene more sustainable as an impact for theatres? Which kind of themes they should treat? I don't know, only a BP, so something like this. So what could be your idea for giving this lighthouse character to theatres even more? I, I, I personally think that uh, every theater will have their its own way there. I guess there are theaters which are which are good for 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 a piece about insects and something like that. But I mean, we have so many others where we can say, okay, let's adapt old and traditional pieces, classic pieces, and bring the bring them into the new topics. And let's the mirror. I mean, in the the times when these pieces has been developed or written, they had social questions, for example. But today, these social questions are linked to the ecological questions. And so, I guess you can bring these ecological sustainability aspects in the classical topics as well. And it would be good to see the creativity of the theaters to 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 make that visible. Then that key you can. Do that with some some things in the costumes and uh, on, on stage. You can do that with light, uh, slightly changes of the of the text and so on and so on. And I, I'm not the expert. I'm here to learn from the theater makers what's possible and what not. But what we can do is really that we as NABU. I mean, we have almost 800,000 people who are following and supporting us as members and supporters. So we have a peer group in society which we can bring together with your peer groups then. And that can be something well, pretty nice. <laughs> For sure it can. And by the way, bringing together is exactly what we will do right now. By the way, I'm, I think this is a, a supplementary, very important aspect, visibility and communication printing in the program, uh, how much less uh, carbon you use for this because of, it starts with small things like, I don't know, glass straws uh, until big isolations or topics on scene. Absolutely. There is no limit uh, for the way sustainability can uh, enter the theater world. So to enter our, um, our discussion right now, I'm delighted to meet the, the to introduce to you the other four panelists. Uh, Jörg Andreas, you stay with us, of course. We have speakers from Scotland, Estonia and Switzerland. I'm absolutely delighted about this. And before I'm really presenting them and before we going deeper into this, I just want to ask the same short question to all five of you with uh, Jörg Andreas. If you were the Minister of Environment in your country, you are named and tomorrow you have to make your first big announcement what would be the first measure you would like to implement? Let's start with Katrina Patterson from Scotland for a little answer. Hello, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I think it's a very difficult question um, to answer and I'm, that's, I, I guess I'm lucky in terms of going first. Um, so one thing that I would do uh, would be to introduce our individual carbon budget for every person in uh, the country, where you have a certain amount of uh, carbon emissions that you are kind of permitted to, uh, uh, to use in a given year, but you can't go over that. Um, it's a really boring policy measure. I know it's not necessarily the most exciting mm, thing. But no, the, not boring. <laughs> the reason I suggest it is because I think it would have systemic changes across lots of different ways in which we live and work. And it would affect both our public um, institutions, but also the private companies which interact with us on a, on a daily basis. And importantly, I think it would also become a bit of a, a social justice leveler, because at the moment we live in a society where people who are able to, who, people who pollute the environment um, and it cause the most carbon emissions are the ones who are normally the most affluent in our society. And so um, we risk otherwise penalizing people who uh, don't emit as much because they, they can't afford to. So it Very be pragmatic and interesting proposition. Thank you, Katrina. Let's turn to our Swiss, uh, Swiss friends, Vin Vincent Boudrier and Caroline Barnaud. What would, you, what would be your first measure if you would be named Environmental Minister of Switzerland? So I let my minister of um, <laughs> speak. So I will propose uh, the implementation of uh, ecological transition income uh, as conceptualized by Sophie Swatton. Um, it's a way to link social economy and ecology. 
it's an income uh, that is um, not uh, unconditional like the universal basic income, but based on environmental and social activity compatible with the limits of biosphere. The idea is to accompany a citizen to develop projects in collaboration with a local institution, association, cooperatives. Wonderful, a very large measure who will englobe everything. I would vote for you, this is for sure. Let's see what is the idea of Rez Aus, our guest from Estonia. Rez, what, uh, what is your idea? Please share with us. Yeah, hello, nice to meet you all. Um, I think I would go for uh, radical transparency, just really to understand uh, how everything works, because uh, of course, uh, the change is coming and uh, we have in Europe uh, quite strict uh, criteria already in place, but uh, we can't implement it without knowing how the life is. So without transparency, there will be no change. So uh, I know it's, it's complicated, especially for the, for the businesses, but I think this is something what we really need. No, no, no. You're mute. Thank you so much. Thank you for this idea. You're totally right. General transparency would be great, especially I think about something like lobbying uh, uh, in the bad way. There's also good lobbying, but this would be certainly helpful. Jörg Andreas, what's your idea from the NABU perspective? What would you do as a new um, environmental minister? I want to go for a for a um, carbon price, for example. So the, the the thing is that we have to implement the external costs of our way of living and producing. And uh, at the moment, we have you see that in forestry and agriculture, a lot of invisible costs. So farming practices ruin the the rainforest with the soil production, and we ruin our uh, soils um, with uh, with the intensive um, livestock production, and so on and so on. And we have to bring that all together. And we just published a study a, a year ago, where we said, okay, forty percent of these. Uh, environmental costs of German agriculture is just coming from livestock, for example. So that is the transparency thing. And there's the thing where we say we have to send price signals. So bring all the costs for the regeneration of the soils and for all the things into the price of meat. You will see that meat will become much more expensive than, than it is like today in Germany. I know there are different levels of pricing uh, among the European countries. But that is for me uh, part of honesty and transparency as well, so that we really make things comparable with one currency, which we all know, and that's money. Thank you so much, Jörg Andreas. Yes, a carbon price, very good idea. Of course, meat is crucial. Meat prices are crucial, crucial in Germany for this big meat eaters, but also on t-shirts, for example. We have no idea. We know the price of the t-shirt, but we don't know the impact on the environment. We will talk about this a little bit later with Rez also has a lot of things to say about this. Yes. Put on a carbon price, very good uh, supplementary suggestion. Thank you very much for this little introduction um, around. Now I will first turn to Katrina Patterson to uh, um, present her a little bit better. She is working, she's a program manager of the transformation of culture at the Create, Creative Carbon Scotland. This is an organization who supports uh, the reducing of carbon footprints and enact their environmental sustainable strategy. Um, this in initiative provides, for example, for Scottish art uh, organizations, a training in carbon measures, reporting and reducing exactly what we talked already about. This is one of the first steps, understand what's going wrong and then take some me measures. Katrina manages also the cultural adaptation program um, um, and with programs across Europe, not only for Scotland, you're also working in pro for projects in Ireland, Belgium and Sweden. Um, and so let's give us a little better idea about what you're doing and how you are talking and helping in art institutions and especially theaters to have a better overview of their carbon footprint, please, Katrina. Thank you. Yes, so Creative Carbon Scotland has been working in Scotland since 2011. Um, and when we first started, uh, it was very much uh, an education program, really. I think, you know, it's hard to remember what the world was like in 2011 and also where we were when it came to talking about climate change and environmental sustainability. And I think 
since uh, now almost 10 years has led to a massive um, kind of awakening of people thinking about the impact that they are having on our planet. Um, so we have helped to kind of take the arts and cultural sector in Scotland through that change um, and move really people from conversations from what is climate change to what can I do about climate change to now how can I lead society in addressing climate change. And there are three kind of aims that we work for. The first is to lead the Scottish cultural sector and obviously theatre is a huge part of that but for us it also includes the visual arts, music, literature, film and television, storytelling, kind of anything that comes under the arts banner. So to lead the arts and cultural sector to net zero emissions by the year 2045, which is the Scottish government target. The second is to make sure that the wider society recognises the role of arts and culture in addressing climate change. So often when you hear climate policy, it is talking about transport or agriculture or manufacturing. And obviously these things are, are critical and so important uh, to think about. But we know, um, and I'm sure we all here know today, the huge power of arts and culture and the potential that we have to contribute. So we want to make sure that policymakers, that um, businesses, that individuals, organisations recognise the value of, of arts and culture in this transformation. And lastly, we think that their, the arts and culture have more to give in terms of our creativity and the way in which we work and the way in which we do things. So we want to prompt more collaboration between um, non-cultural organisations, and by that we mean like kind of anyone, but particularly those working on environmental sustainability and climate change, to work together um, and find new ways of doing things. Um, so a, a couple of very short examples from our projects, and um, we say that we work to uh, on four different ways to address the practical emissions of climate change from the sector, uh, to prompt artistic thinking about climate change, to engage others through their audiences with our staff, with suppliers, um, and also to advocate for change at a kind of policy level. Um, and you've already mentioned our carbon management program, um, which encourages organizations to understand the emissions that they're causing, create interventions to reduce those, uh, and also cultural adaptations, which moves us from just thinking about how do we reduce the impact of our work, but also how are we going to live in a future which is now definitely going to be changed by climate change in some way. And um, so within that, I'm looking at how four different city regions in Northwest Europe um, will have to adapt. So I think maybe enough for me just now. Oh, it is just enough for the beginning, Katrina, not enough at all. Thank you very much for sharing all these details. Um, what I think when I listen to you is also this lighthouse function, the cultural scene and the theatres in this especially can have to make this awakeness of the society, even if we are a little bit further than right now awakening. Do you have a concrete example what a Scottish theatre, for example, did to take all his place in the society, not only, you know, concentrated on the, concentrated on the own theatre world, but to make it more collaborative with the society around, with the city, with the land? So I think one example with that would be um, the Edinburgh Science Festival, um, which has now dedicated a huge part of its programme exclusively to talking about climate change and bringing in loads of partners, not just saying, you know, we are a festival, so we have a, this very small remit or something. They are thinking internationally, they are thinking, well, they're thinking from the community level to the international level and bringing in the lots of unusual partners as well not just the kind of the usual suspects when it comes to climate change the people you always see talking about these things but completely new areas so i think that's one particularly good example thank you very much this is the kind of example we are looking for and uh, this is a wonderful transition to present you a little bit better vincent boudrier and caroline bernot they are so the artistic director and the director of artistic and international projects of the theater de vidi in lausanne in switzerland beautiful pure air country of course and uh, you also did exactly this you tried to find roots in the society by organizing a conference cycle uh, with not only artists but also researchers philosophers I saw a wonderful YouTube with a very 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 sympathetic um, philosophic thinker and you want to gather uh, make imaginary new futures possible please uh, tell us a little bit about this experience Vincent and Carolina yeah, no, first, uh, thank you, ETC, for the invitation. And I think uh, it's a quite uh, important matter, the climate change. 
And for me, theater has an important role in this ecological and sustainable uh, revolution of a society. Because theater, I think, first is a collective place inscribed in the art of our society and our city. Because the artwork is an opportunity to reformulate personal and collective concern without distinguishing um, between pleasures, emotion, memories, and reflection. And theater for me is a place for meeting and sharing on the edge between political issues, knowledge, and emotions. The Théâtre de Vidi is a creation theater with an international program, and we present our own production abroad. So the challenge of having a sustainable activity is not easy, and we are working on it step by step. We are working with, um, on different levels. Uh, first, ecology and sustainability are, an important, are important themes of our artistic creation. And we use the symbolic power of theatrical art in the society to talk about it. For instance, we just commissioned a show, uh, ecological show, to present in the class of the college and high school of the region. Second point, we create a dialogue between artists, researcher, scientist, philosopher, and university to produce new narrative. Uh, for instance, as you say, we initiated last year a seminar entitled Imagining Possible Futures with philosopher. Last year, it was the ecological philosopher Dominique Bou. This year is a science, science philosopher Vinciane Desprez. Uh, and with the um, University of Lausanne and the goal is to um, make work together uh, artists and scientists uh, to invent new narrative and new formats. Uh, then, obviously, as Jacques Andrea say, we work to improve step by step and with humility our carbon footprint and our sustainability in all the professional and public aspect of our project. We organize a green team inside the team of VD with a representative of each department to analyze the situation and improve um, uh, and, and propose improvement for the technique with uh, less energy, for uh, less energy consumption, with the light, with the sun, with the video, for the set construction, with better material and recycling, with the tool for the transportation and the travel, for the restaurant with local product and vegetarian menu, for the communication with less print document, better ink and better digital communication, uh, we invite beehives on the roof, so we have bees around the theater. And uh, we also study to, to improve the carbon footprint of the audience, which is one of the key questions also for theater. Also, we work on the renovation of the building. So we initiated a big plan of renovation uh, five years ago. First, we changed a circus big top in a theater wood with an innovative and ecological architecture was uh, the a laboratory of research of um, the University of Lausanne. And then now we are renovated the Max Bill Theater built in 64 uh, with uh, thermal insulation, green roof, um, solar panel on the roof. And, um, and even if for me, the ecological dimension is not as far as we designed because it's a renovation of the old building and because the budget is limited by the project owner, which is um, the city of Lausanne. For me, all this uh, work we are doing, um, it's important um, to link this dimension with an important complex issue, the how to reduce the carbon footprint and of our activity while allowing the circulation of artists and artworks between cultures and continents. So from, for us, sustainability must integrate social and cultural issues in addition to ecological issues, including post-colonial and diversity issues. And maybe to, to make, a, uh, make the major project we are developing uh, is led by Caroline uh, and the provisional title is No Travel and she will present it. Okay, thank you. So uh, together with uh, Cathy Mitchell and Jerome Bell, we decided, uh, Jerome Bell and Cathy Mitchell are two international artists who decided to stop flying years ago. Um, they both uh, took this decision uh, for ecological reasons. Um, together with them, we're trying to design a new um, project. Uh, the provisional title is No Travel, because the first rule of the project was uh, nobody will travel. And uh, the second rule was uh, it will be an international project. So there is a contradiction at the beginning. We will try to solve with this project. 
it's very important for us that this project is not a model of production. It's just a full-scale exercise. So the idea is to question the whole process of production and touring from the, the pers perspective of, of sustainability. So we, um, we decided to analyze with the partners, with the artists, all the steps of producing and presenting and touring theater. Um, we uh, will create the show remotely. Cathy Mitchell in London, uh, Jérôme Bell in Paris, and Théâtre de Vidi in Lausanne. Um, the, sorry, uh, the um, project will be uh, restaged in each country by a local team, including a local director. So Cathy Mitchell and Jérôme Bell and Théâtre de Vidi will uh, write all together a script. And this script will be the base of a new production in each country. Uh, that means that there will, there will be no um, cash flow, no, no, no money, no exchange of money, but only exchange of ideas. And uh, we will work in parallel in uh, many different countries. Um, there will be a co-production um, budget shared between the partners, but this um, Oh, you are freezed. Oh, we have a little technical problem. Please go on, Caroline. You're not freezed anymore. Okay. So the co-production fee will be calculated on the carbon carbon footprint of each country. And um, so, according to the to the national um, carbon footprint of the country, we will decide the proportion uh, to be paid by each partner. And the first step of the collaboration with the partners coming from all over the world will be to fill all together a questionnaire we are developing with the um, University of Lausanne. It's a questionnaire on sustainability with a lot of uh, questions of, of, on all the practices of a theater, but also a lot of questions on feelings and, uh, and how to deal with sustainability. Um, and we are working for this project with the scientific committee composed of uh, researchers com uh, of Lausanne University, female researchers of, of the Department of Sustainability of Lausanne University. So we are now in the process. It's super complicated and super <laughs> interesting. It's a lot of production uh, challenges and a lot of interesting discussion about theater as well, because when we have to to make it with um, the lowest amount of carbon possible, we have to decide what it is important and what it is not. We've already decided that we will keep audience, live audience, and live performer. So this is <laughs> this is already a big amount of carbon. So we will have to do uh, the best uh, show possible and the most activist of show possible because we will spend a lot of carbon with this first decision. Um, regarding the content, they are discussing a lot to find uh, what to talk about. And at this moment, we are all overwhelmed with all the information, but also with all the feelings. And one of the topics of the show could be how to process all the information and how to transform feelings into action. Wonderful and very ambitious program, Carolyn. I mean, by listening to both of you, you're looking like a laboratory where you try everything you can do to go green. This is great. By the way, by listening to you also, I thought about the Festival of Aix-en-Provence, who also has a quite elaborated green program already, step by step. They're working since year on it, and they're going on and going on. This is, of course, this is exemplary. We can't say differently. And when I listened to you, Vincent, I thought about, but what's with touring? And then came all your part and you explained all of this. I have one subversive question about this. Of course, it is better if uh, the ensemble is not touring and everybody stays and no travel. But what's about the excitement for the actors, for the director to go to another city, discover the reaction of another uh, audience, uh, uh, working together, create new links because you sleep in hotels or in youth hostels together? I don't know what we do with this part. I know it's, it's a, subversive, a subversive question given our topic, but how do you deal with this 
deception I by think, not touring and not traveling? No, no, I think it's, it's a quick question. I think this no travel project is an experiment to, to see what, what's happened if we're not traveling. But I think we also keep this idea of um, sharing experience between cultures and between cities is important. So how to travel in a better way, uh, how to save in the transportation, so to fight with a set designer that the set is not four track, but only one small track to fight uh, when we organize a tour to try to uh, make more career on the touring and having more city in the same space, especially if you go to another continent. Uh, maybe to invent also step by step new form of project that maybe the set is not traveling and we can rebuild the set somewhere with recycling projects. So integrate this question from the beginning of the consciousness of the project. And for me, it's also very important to keep the contact with artists from other continents. So to keep the link with the team from Africa, from South America. So how to bring them not only maybe for a few days and then going back home, but maybe to have a more um, time in the city, maybe to experiment more local project with them. So to keep this idea of confrontation of cultures and, uh, and to be open to the world. I think which is very dangerous that for culture, the uh, local answer is the only answer. Maybe it's good for food, maybe it's good for some goods. But not for culture. For culture, we, this is a key contradiction of the subject and we have to that's why we, 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 I say we work with humility and step by step because the answer is not easy, but how to solve this question, but getting the door open to the world. Uh, it's very good to, to make a relativization of uh, what you say. I would say what Caroline proposes is a radical approach, but it's very good to try this and to test it out. But there's also, for example, a middle way, like I would call the slow theater. People coming longer, travel is longer and not so a high carbon uh, print. Maybe there's a way in between. And as you say, the answer will be multiple in every way because there's not only one. Let's uh, join. Thank you very much for, for this very interesting insight of what we're doing in Lausanne. And uh, let me introduce you our last panelist, Red Aus. Uh, we, hello, Red, in Estonia. Uh, Jörg Andreas already mentioned uh, one of the very practical recommendations is the reuse, the recycling of things. So you also talked about smaller or reusable set things. And this is exactly your topic, if I can say so. You are a PhD qualified fashion and costume designer and an environmental activist. In your biography is written, born to be a rebel. I love this. So please explain us how in which way you make your uh, a, a tissue costume and design revolution. Thank you. Yes, that's true. I, um, I have been working with uh, existing materials um, since uh, I started my career, probably after my MA studies uh, 2002. So it's, uh, it's quite a long time, let's say 18 years already. I, I haven't um, bought any new material for my designs or for my, for my theater costumes. And uh, for me, the theater, of course, has been such an um, mm, interesting and, uh, and very practical lab where I can test all my ideas, what I have had. But I'm graduated as fashion designer and my, my background is, is, uh, is, is design. But uh, yeah, the, the main reason why I, I became, uh, especially uh, earlier days, uh, focusing only to the, the, the theater costume and not only costume also I used to do the set quite a lot was exactly uh, environmental um, issues. I, I studied fashion design and I, I, I figured out that the, the industry I have chosen is, uh, is one of the um, ironical one like really one of the the, the most evil uh, evil ones so I, I didn't want to become part of that industry. And um, that's how I found theater. And I was really lucky to start um, working here in Estonia with, uh, with new wave, new, very um, alternative, uh, new wave theaters who are very open, testing different ideas, uh, uh, going uh, already sustainable, like uh, 15, 20 years ago, like project, like going to the island, uh, putting up the theater house uh, with no electric electri elect electricity, etc. So. It has been really, really a lot of uh, testing and, and, and very, very, very interesting journey. And, and um, that's uh, how actually I became uh, back to the fashion uh, some, some years ago. I understood that if I actually can implement upcycling 
um, idea to the theater costume, I would probably be able to implement that to the fashion industry as well. And um, that was the moment when I started my doctoral studies. And then I focused really how we could uh, make the fashion industry more sustainable. And the area where I've been focusing uh, many, many years is actually waste, textile waste mostly. And uh, uh, my experience is that we really, especially in the theater where the creativity is a big part of it, you really don't have to go and buy new materials or the, of course, sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes it's required because the, the, the piece is like this, but uh, um, I, I very systematically worked with our recycling center, testing how to make costumes from home textiles, uh, from uh, old, um, like just post-consumer waste, the, the really the, 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 the post-consumer waste, what people really don't, don't want anymore, how to use it as a raw material to put together the, the new, new uh, pieces. And also one of the first, first works I did together with uh, Tallinn City Theatre, where I used to work as a, as a head designer many years, was I was really focusing only to the existing materials in, in the house. And uh, that what I have found in the theater is actually extremely, extremely interesting and very, very inspiring that uh, you go and you, you, you dig into the, the, the stores and you find such interesting pieces, what you redesign later on. So yes, redesign, reuse, upcycling, they have been my methods very long time and, um, and it's, I have understood slowly that actually it's, there are many benefits doing things. Of course, one is fi financial benefit. I think uh, I have been doing the pieces with the lowest uh, budget and it was a little joke meanwhile here as well that the theaters are bringing me in because uh, I'm, I'm not spending uh, money. But this is also very convenient for the, for the theater, I think. But, but of course, the other hand, uh, I understood that even actors actually uh, like this kind of method because when you use um already existing materials or if you if you if you uh, put uh, clothes on the stage uh, with history already they have lived their life already they they actually give some extra level or like extra value and then for the act actors it's actually something they they could relate really easily that they don't have the ready-made piece they have to start uh, live into it but they already have have the costume with the history, with the background. It's it's uh, and if you put it together in the right way, it actually also can help actor quite a bit. And then um, I'm partly academic as well. I'm I'm senior researcher in Estonian Academy of Arts. We have a sustainable design lab, and we have uh, done quite many uh, nice projects. One of the projects was also together with the Estonian or the Tallinn City Theatre. We went through one year. Uh, making the environmental calculations and uh, the analysis for the theater and um, applied for the green um, uh, certificate for the theater. It was a long process. The, the building or buildings, let's say that way, are extremely old. Uh, uh, Tallinn City Theater is located in the old town, so the buildings are 600, 500 years old, so not, um, uh, let's say, uh, heating was one of the biggest problems there, but a lot of small things you probably all know how to do it, how to go through of it. But it was, it was really interesting. Also, I think for the for the theater uh, itself, really to to open all the bookkeeping in the way to see how much we spend, how our uh, uh, waste management is organized, uh, how actually how much we can, how we work with the city, how can actually we can recycle and uh, also to put some ground rules in the theater as well like earlier uh, was mentioned water one of the trickiest thing was kind of to get through the, with the with the message that actually the tap water in Tallinn is very good quality that we don't have to consume the the bottled water just the theater gave to every every um, person the the, the uh, reusable bottle etc like lots of very small details small things and it was not very easy, uh, uh, very easy to go through of it, uh, to get everybody on board and to understand why are we doing it. But finally, when we when we got um, quite uh, nice numbers to convince why we should change, for example, the lightning is is the biggest uh, biggest uh, part of the consumption, of course. I think in the every theater and, and the city theater is is 
is um, quite specific because um, we have like uh, five stages. It means that uh, the, the light park is uh, five times, which is uh, basically you heat up one room one evening for only like uh, uh, hundred people sometimes, sometimes even less. So it's, um, it was extremely interesting journey and, and uh, we, we learned a lot, but, um, but I think the, the idea of upcycling and redesigning in the theater is uh, we should see it more as the, uh, as the um, artistic uh, challenge as well, not only from the environmental point of view, which is there is no top definitely needed, uh, but sometimes it's just uh, the matter of the, the, the artist. Uh, it's much easier to go to the shop and, uh, and buy the, the material. It's much easier just to draw the sketch and then go and find the, 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 the right material. Or if you have the idea that you need exactly that kind of boots, then you go to the shop and buy them. But I would say it's, it's actually very, very interesting and challenging to, to first of all, to see what you have and then through that transform that what you have it to, to something what actually you would like to present on the stage and uh, and i i really mm, have found in these tw almost 20 years there is nothing you can't uh, do without uh, these uh, ups with upside without upcycling or, or recy recycling or, or reuse basically it's all of your own ideas and your own uh, creativity how you put things together Wonderful, Riz. Thank you very much to give it this huge insight. I have two, uh, one question and then a remark. Just please tell us a little bit more what you mean by upcycling uh, um, in opposite to recycling. And then by listen to you, I mean, this fits perfectly the plans and the ideas of the other panelists. But wouldn't, the, wouldn't uh, would it be a nice idea to create a label for theaters who do what you propose, not buying, but recycling and upcycling it will just explain us a little bit better so i would advocate for a label a green theater label maybe not for everything but in this case for example for the use of costumes uh, not by buying new things yes um, upcycling um, is um, the method if you take the material as it is and through design bring it back to the cycle Recycling is when you take, for example, when you make from the plastic bottles uh, the new fabric or uh, there is a um, process between what takes some uh, resources. And um, we see the hierarchy then al always goes reuse, then comes upcycling and then comes recycling. Of course, reuse is the best and in the theater, the, the redesign is also a very important uh, method. You just uh, take old costume, you change it a little bit, you just uh, but when we are talking about upcycling, then you really you take it apart and you put together the new piece of it. Um, when we're talking about uh, uh, labels, then uh, uh, when we go back to the, the fashion industry, then years ago we developed together with Stockholm Environmental Institute uh, a certification upmate, which is exactly uh, the method for the factories. And I have been thinking many times that this is actually something you could implement to the to the theaters as well, because it really uh, you have to see the the, the production and uh, in every theater has the small production as well, and it's 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 done like this. And the uh, second thing, what we have been brainstorming with the Stockholm Environmental Institute, for example, that there is the green office, and uh, and they are planning to um, develop green university certi certificate. Uh, it would be very easy actually to adapt a little bit and to create the green theater certificate. Which is, uh, which I think is 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 brilliant idea, because uh, in very, not very big, but quite uh, simple toolbox, you could make uh, the organization so much more uh, sustainable. sustainable. It's, it's it's just some it's a little bit this kind of toolbox. It's it would be just really not uh, smart if it, every theater does it by itself. If it's done one time, you can really play it, like put it from one to another, etc. It's very easily because theater, basically, ninety percent of the theaters, they, the system is the same. The production is the same. They work in the same day, same system. They use the same materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's very, very good idea from you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Red, to uh, share all this experience for us. I love the sustainable way. I would like to ask to Katrina Patterson in Scotland. 
uh, this idea of uh, reuse, upcycle and recycle. Is this also something that is a part of your advising to the Scottish uh, theatre world, if I can say so, in the, in the frame of your work? Yes, very much so. Um, and it was really exciting to hear about Rhett's work um, because, yes, we would follow the same kind of waste hierarchy, as we call it, where we would have reuse as the kind of primary aim and then upcycling, recycling, and then eventually even kind of biodegradable elements as well. So, you know, we have a few initiatives that are running in Scotland, um, one called Reset Scenery, which um, actually works out of one of the big um, kind of art schools in Glasgow, where kind of stage sets that are not being used can be um, kind of remade into other materials or stored for a period of time because as um, we have found there's lots of uh, Christmas productions come around every year and it's only like one year there'll be uh, the Snow Queen and then two years later the Snow Queen set needs to be used again so actually having somewhere to store materials is a big thing. We've also recently um, been working with an organization called the Circular Arts Network which kind of combines the more the raw materials that you might have. So um, kind of particular pieces of vi a visual arts exhibition that might be relevant for a theater production as well. So trying to get that communication and circularity happening. Um, and then finally, um, maybe we'll mention another company called Equal Drama, which is uh, based in Glasgow in Scotland. And they have also, they work mainly with um, schools productions and they have begun designing uh, edible, uh, compostable and biodegradable set. Uh, so they work with the children to grow the set uh, and then use the set in productions and then afterwards it becomes um, kind of food for the school and for the individuals participating. So lots of different options. Ah, I love the idea of growing, uh, of eating the set after the piece. This is of course, this is perfect for me as a gourmand. I would also like uh, um, to have a little uh, uh, echo from Jörg Andreas Krüger about all of this because so the label idea, um, maybe we can pursue a little bit also, but what I would also like, because the label goes in this direction, it's fantastic if theatres start to go green and do all the things. We have so many inspirational ideas already, but then the next part, and I think maybe you can help us here a little bit out, Jörg Andreas, is how to communicate this. Because if the theatre is changing into green, this is great, and reducing the carbon print, the, the, the footprint, but now we have also to, trans, to make a kind of transmission to the public to let them know. Maybe you have some inspiring ideas for us, Jörg Andreas, because this is what NABU is also doing, communicating about their actions. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I'm really, really impressed by all the ideas and uh, the activities which are already uh, under pro process in, in different regions of Europe. So, wow, it's really impress impressive. Um, we, have, we have heard a lot about um, CO2 emissions, about process and production and reuse and upcycling. I would give uh, the question back again uh, um, about the biodiversity part a little bit. So have you thought about making biodiversity visible, doing something for biodiversity around the theaters whenever it's possible? I know there are some theaters maybe in the city Just, center. Jörg Andres, uh, uh, in VD, uh, there is already bees on the roof. Uh, we heard about this, right? You are, there is already yeah. some biodiversity, just to uh, mention this. Yeah, and, and that's good. And I mean, if we are talking about a kind of um, label or something, uh, I, I, I see these three the step stones which should be part of every strategy. It's one, one is CO2 emissions. I mean, we can't do a lot of things without having a focus on CO2 emissions. We have heard about the heating and the lightning and the transport question. So that is a little bit the white elephant in the room where, where we have to come down from our emissions. And I like the idea of these zero net emission strategy, um, which you introduced to us. That, that is a good point. And then we can always discuss when it's not avoidable, how can we maybe offset? What do you do with the offsets? Do you invest that in energy saving measurements or other transport measurements? Many, many technical things then. Then we have these green office procurement and production things. So what do you buy? What do you use? How do you reuse this? How do you recycle it and so on? And we have still at the end, the biodiversity thing. I would put that together. And it would be great to have an organization which is like, okay, we are here um, in the European Theatre Association or in other associations. We are hosting this kind of initiative so that we have a movement of European theatres. And that's then for me the step to more visibility as well. I mean, 
becoming more visible has different aspects. You can have uh, have it on a local level for for your city, for your region, and for your audience. For you, for your audience, where you, you uh, where you have some some activities like you, I guess many of the theaters have the one year day in the year where everybody can go to the theater and look behind the scenes and and so on and so on. Make that to a topic there. Make it to a topic in the programs. Uh, com combine uh, and cooperate with uh, civil society organizations like. Uh, from the environmental side or the social side, bring that together, use their magazines as well. And right then, and then the, the other point is really, we have heard so many creative things with lighthouses. Use, use the, the cooperation with, with others and make it visible in the media. I mean, it's, I mean the media, are, they're desperately looking for something what is, what is hopeful and what it's positive. I mean, uh, sometimes I can't hear myself speaking anymore since I always say, oh, the, 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 the end is near and biodiversity crisis and climate crisis and blah, blah, blah. No, that's, that's, we have the chance and the obligation to do something against it. And that's something very proactive, very positive. And let's use us together that for communication, make it visible in the TV, make it visible in the news and all the, the, the different streams of media. From the yellow press to the to the um, uh, uh, scientific papers. I mean, there are a lot of things. And at the end, we can have festivals. We have can we can have campaigns. I mean, uh, just, just uh, we are able as NABU, for example, to to have a newsletter with up to 150, 200,000 uh, people signing up for the newsletter within a week sometimes when the topic is really challenging and inspiring. So Wonderful. So you propose that uh, some good initiatives or some calls for implication can go through your newsletter, Jürgen Andreas? For, sure. for sure, always. I mean, we always need positive, impactful and meaningful stories. Otherwise, all the discussions about the concerns of the crisis is, are too depressive. <laughs> yeah, but just let me let me add as a news person, as a journalist, for us, unfortunately, bad news are good news. So unfortunately, <laughs> when you're open with a catastrophe with thousands of dead people, you're sure you have an audience. Good news are not so easy to sell. Just uh, I'm sorry to put a bemol uh, on what you just said, but of course I agree. Thank you so much. We will open right up. I have a lot of questions here in the uh, coming up in the uh, in the in the chats. The first question is for Vincent and Caroline. I will just read it to you, Vincent and Caroline. It's from Christy Roma. She says, I, th I suppose that Christy is a girl. I'm sorry, Christy, maybe Christian, Christy Roma. I think that the usual theater audiences are also more likely to be interested in sustainability. How can theater reach the wider society that may be less engaged and encourage them wi for wide environmental action? This is a question to our Swiss friends. Can you repeat the question once? The idea is just how you can engage parts of the society who maybe not so environmental aware yet into this Go Green initiative and marathon we are all talking about. Yeah. I, I think uh, first, all the audience of a theater is not so convinced that uh, <laughs> it's a imagine question. Uh, uh, for example, just when we change the menu of the of the restaurant of the of the theater, when we don't have meat uh, for the audience, it's a question for some people. And uh, so it's a small example. When we will talk about the transport of the audience, it's also a question that a lot of people maybe are sensitive but not totally convinced by by the way. And then I think this is this is a um, for what I uh, I say about the symbolic power of of theater. Uh, when we do something in a theater, we touch more people than uh, just the audience gathered in the uh, in the building of the theater. Uh, before we were working in Avignon Festival, and it was quite um, important the symbolic power of each act we are doing. And if we use, we, if you make a, a big a big project with uh, an important uh, director to talk about it, then we will get a, a large audience. So I think. This symbolic power, the example of culture, can also influence in a wider way than just the audience of, of theater. So we have to use this, this power of art. There is a supplementary question to this aspect, a little provocative. The idea is, should audience members who come to the theater by personal car 
pay more for their ticket than those who use public transports or bicycles instead. What do you think about this? Yes, it's one of the ideas we are uh, we have. We we have a little group of discussion with the ticket uh, ticket selling department, and so we 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 are discussing how to engage the audience in the questioning. So we want. Do we print the ticket? If we print the ticket, do we use the ticket as uh, something to communicate with the audience? Do we make a, um, a price for the ticket based on uh, the way of uh, transportation they're using? So a lot of questioning. We have not no not yet the answer, but we have this kind of question. And the no travel project, as it is a, an exercise, an experiment, and it's the good occasion to test a dispositive like this one. Um, tickets based on the carbon footprint of the transportation or things like that, because it, it won't be for the whole theater. It, it would be only for this uh, lab project we are developing. Yes, because it's also it's a little bit frightened to punish uh, an audience who comes to a theater, if I can say so. Yes, Vincent. Yeah, man, and maybe I think, as, uh, as I was not about this question of biodiversity, so it's linked also to the diversity uh, of the audience, of the diversity of the artist. And I think we have to, to fight also to keep this diversity. It's an, an, another biodiversity. And this question of um, how you touch uh, audience with this question, also with people of different social class and different economic power. Um, and from one side, it's, it's easier maybe to make a sensitive some rich people, but also we have a big, huge car and <laughs> it's a big uh, cardboard footprint. But also it's a big question for people who don't have the choice of uh, how to move, how to behave, how to buy clothes, a cheap clothes, but maybe with a bad footprint. So it's also a social, it's also a social question. And in the question of sustainability, this economical and social question, I quite, uh, it's very important to link with this idea of um, ecological improvement. You are muted. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, what a beginner's error. How could I? So thank you very much, Vincent and Caroline. And I have another question who goes exactly to this social direction. And it's for you, Jörg Andreas. Uh, the question is this one. You mentioned that ecological solutions must go hand in hand with social solutions. How can we bring, bring different sectors like NGOs and art organizations together to fight for this environment? Hmm. I think um, discussions like we have today are the first step maybe to, to, to go into the details and go together then into the media, into the political discussions to fight for these combination of social and ecological uh, questions and movements. And hmm, I, what, what I always find important is that, um, and that's uh, maybe a link back uh, to, to Vincent, um, is that Yes, we have some. Sometimes we have the impression that we have uh, the the entrance and the link to ecological questions is maybe a little bit more developed in higher class uh, or higher income society parts. But on the other hand, and that's what that's what we experience that, that since more than hundred years now is in our groups we have many many people which you normally would say they are maybe not that educated not that rich living there in the rural regions and so on and so on and they have they have their own very specific personal link to nature and the environment so, uh, completely different things and discussions and uh, that's what i so enjoy in my job so to travel sometimes to the groups and then i'm always impressed and surprised about the thoughts and the thinkings and so on and so so i think sometimes i think it's too easy what we say very often in the in the in the capitals of a country so yes we have these different society levels and uh, the, the higher income, they are easier to convince since they can pay for, for some preservation of the ecosystem. And yeah, to come back to the original question, what can we do together? Just giving example, creating solutions or ideas of solutions and then going uh, to the uh, city of Berlin or to, to, to higher governmental levels and uh, fighting for it, lobbying for it. I mean, I'm 50% of my job is lobbyism. I'm a lobbyist. So <laughs> positive <laughs> lobbyist job, <Jörg>. Andreas. <laughs> just, just do it. I mean, we, we know what we want. 
Um, thank you very much for the answer. I would like to take one aspect and uh, take it over to Estonia, to Rez. You just talked about, and this is right, this is quite urban talk, what we are doing here. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the educated urban people. And I think one of the problems in general in the world right now, let's not start with Trump, uh, the Orange Man and the White House or something like this, is that we do not listen enough to the people living far away from the urban centers. So I would like to know from Estonia experience, you also work in Tallinn especially, but for example, your idea of uh, not buying any more clothes and do this whole process for theater costumes, does this also apply to local theaters in Estonia or only to Tallinn National Theater? Uh, difficult to say. Uh, I mean, Estonia is, uh, if you think, uh, only 1.3 million people living here. And, uh, and from that, around uh, 600,000 lives in Tallinn, which is uh, for Estonia actually a very big problem because if you really travel through Estonia, it's completely empty. And I have been part of uh, building up one um, eco village in Estonia 16 years, um, just exactly started as the uh, uh, kind of um, alternative uh, project to understand how that would be to build up independent um, society uh, in the countryside in Estonia. And uh, it's very successful, it's independent, it, it works. Uh, and uh, that was the uh, around 10 years ago, we started to implement uh, permaculture into that uh, communi community. And this is my second very big passion. I have my own little land also separately where I'm I'm um, learning actually in, in really in very, very down to earth level how to make the, the, the private space um, independent the way that everything what you as a human produce can stay in the same amount of land, like uh, regarding toilets, water, everything, everything. And uh, just planning to take next weekend chickens as well. So like really to have the, the, the alternative to understand that as well, because I think the, the idea of circularity, at least for, for, for me personally, it really you know, copying the, the circularity in, in the nature. It's the, uh, it's, it's the same thing, that, but somehow we have gone so far from that, that if we think very, it's very simple. Uh, human beings are basically the only ones who are producing waste. Uh, you, you can't find waste from the nature. And uh, keeping that in mind, uh, that has been for me this kind of, um, very big help when I'm designing. Uh, just always to think the uh, this life cycle uh, in the life cycle model, like where I take and where it goes later on. But um, I think Estonia is, is uh, as it is very small and very flexible and still quite young society. It's very very simple to adapt uh, different models here. And uh, this I, I I see now the a uh, lot of activities are popping up where we as a uh, like bigger community is trying to transform and we from this year we have this green tiger very big um, movement uh, like uh, the second very big movement started from Estonia is the clean up day just uh, to to go all together out and 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 um, and pick up waste. Yes, so it's, uh, I can see it's the, because Estonians are introverts, they are very, very uh, nature lovers, and this is something very close to their hearts. But right now, my, my personal feeling is that uh, the city is taking over, and uh, I can see there is new wave people going back to the countryside, starting these experiments, uh, like uh, really trying to put more money efforts to, to keep the, the, the village alive but uh, it's it's actually the, the it's quite sad out there i understand it it's a fertile soil but it needs a lot of soul to make it lively i got this um thank you very much reed um uh, i have another question for katrina in the chat uh, what are the most obvious changes in your work in consulting with cultural organizations since the outbreak of the pandemic so it brings us back a little bit in this very to this very special framed year with all the particular problems. What were the spe specific challenges for you, Katrina? Yes, obviously it's been a very strange year for us all. Um, uh, the biggest shift I would say is the move towards digital production of work. Um, and obviously there was, uh, there was the, the first phase where everyone who had some form of digital archive began streaming it and then now more and more we're seeing um, people creating work originally in a digital format 
So we have heard lots of questions coming up from our cultural community about what is the environmental impact of creating things in a digital way. And that's a, a kind of a, quite a new research area for us, but there's definitely concerns around the materials that you are buying, the kind of electronics that you're buying um, to make this work um, and uh, particularly the, the raw materials that go into this, this production equipment like rare earth metals and the kind of the sustainability of those. Um, but also we're facing lots of questions about um, the increase in energy use that comes from that. So kind of as Jorge Andreas um, mentioned earlier, like switching to renewable energy suppliers is one of the first, first things that people who are shifting more towards a digital can do. One of the other things that has come up is um, we go in and out of different stages of lockdown all the time, as you can imagine, but um, we have been working with a few cultural organisations and, and theatre organisations who have started to make work that can be presented outdoors. Um, so uh, Grid Iron Theatre Company, which is originally a site specific theatre company, they always use quite unusual spaces wanted to produce their uh, their new theatre production in August outdoors with COVID restrictions and they were trying to identify how they could be how conform to the health and safety requirements of masks and um, gloves and hand sanitizers and all these kind of things whilst also retaining the sustainability um, kind of policy and priorities that they hold dear so uh, I think it was very easy for people to just go straight back into using single use plastics, but actually they were able to think, take the, the time to identify what was the best option for them and what kept people safe, but which was also sustainable. Very interesting expert, you're right. Yes, plastic glass was for sure unsustainable, especially when you use them only one time. Uh, by listening to you, I thought another aspect all our friends from Hungary also mentioned in the video uh, to start with, the huge social problem the theatre world is right now facing, all these jobless people oh, who have to do uh, jobs far away from their field of, uh, of competence just to sustain your family. Do we have a chance, uh, this is a question for all of you, do you think there's a chance that there are new jobs can be created around this idea of going green theatre? Maybe like, I don't know, a green coordinator for theatre? When I listen to Vincent and Caroline, or when I listen to what they are doing in the Aix, um, Aix en Provence festival, there are so many coordinations to do, so many knowledge to have. Are there some new job fields could be created by theatre going green? Question for all of you. Oh yeah, I can give a comment. Yeah, definitely, because um, I think it, it's not only about the theatre, for example, Estonian Academy of Arts, hiring the environmental uh, specialist to take care of the building and uh, to put the, the, the um, concept in place. And I, I, I truly think that every theatre, because theatre is also so much about the building uh, and it, it actually requires the different uh, education as well. Uh, the re the really the environmental uh, um, specialist is needed, somebody who can really measure and put it, it a little bit into this kind of academic context and do the, all the calculations. It's definitely the, the field, but not, not only. I think the few theatres have shown that they very, very easily can go to online and, and very fast transform and find the different medias, how actually to keep going on and, and share the, their art and the creation with, with, with people. It's just the adapt, adapt, adaptation. I think uh, if you are able to adapt uh, with the new situation, then, then there is very big uh, chance to survive as well. Yeah, absolutely right. I also thinking about something like, for example, a green community manager. I mean, somebody who make the bridge between all these different parts of the society, because we said theater can do it by itself and it's not the, the idea. Theater is there to spread around this idea. So maybe this could be an idea. Maybe another uh, echo from Vincent and Caroline, okay. Yeah, I think you, you're right. We can create new competence, new, I think we need people to go, to help the theater to go uh, further in this direction and, and faster. And on the other hand, we also, we lose some uh, kind of job, some profession. So in this, it's a transformation. So if we build less set, we need more people in the workshop of that. If we have a, uh, less costume, we are less people in the workshop of costume. So it's a transformation with new competence, new job, 
from one hand and we lose some other activity. And uh, it's also linked to this question of, um, of economy and budget because uh, a lot of decisions are more expensive uh, than what we did before when we have new uh, light spot, when we have to say, okay, we don't fly, but we take the train. It's uh, one day or two day more of travel. So, but two day more of salaries. <laughs> Um, so it, uh, a lot of decisions are linked to um, economical question and, uh, and, cho and budget choice. Uh, so it's quite so difficult to manage with that. And it's also a yeah, huge decision. Uh, if we are local and organic food for the restaurant, it's, it's more expensive. So I, if we want also to open the theater to a social diversity, it's also a question. So it's each step is difficult, each step it's a decision, each step it's a, a choice. And was, that's why we go step by step. Uh, some, sometimes we don't know how to do, sometimes we, so it's a long process. Yeah, and we, we have the feeling that we need to involve the whole team and not to have an expert on board. Um, so experts are super important and we need them to make this transition but the ideal would be that it, this preoccupation will be in the mind of the whole team um, each person in each department and uh, and specialty but instead of having one expert of uh, um, sustainability uh, each person becoming an expert of sustainability in its field I think this is a very good point you make, uh, Caroline, because this is one of the basic, just above the theater, management of change. The key of changing is to take everybody with you, to involve everybody. So just a green manager or a transformation manager wouldn't do it. But th still, I think there are some new uh, jobs and new competency who will come out of this. For example, I don't know, specialist in a, a reusable or recyclable set of material, for example. This is a whole new think set we didn't have before. Our time is about to being at the end, not yet. So I have one question I would like to ask to ask also Heidi and Serge to come up and join us here in the panel for the last minutes, please. So um, as you know, the ETC, uh, the European Theatre Convention, does this kind of uh, um, conferences online and will do more with the aim, with the clear and clear aim to establish a kind of list of recommendations. This is the whole work to do here together, is to figure out all the good ideas coming from Estonia, from Scotland, from Switzerland, from Germany and all over the other countries of Europe to get them together. So would it not be a, one of uh, um, the person here, uh, Joachim Clement asked, would it not be a good idea for all the ETC theaters to try to explore the issue of sustainability using the example of a production this season. Very concrete idea. And to make your network work, in the end, we'll gather, gather at the experience and try to develop a guide for theater. What ETC will has in everything, uh, every case in mind to give a kind of list of recommendations. So in this very special year, is this not the moment to do a sustainable exemplary piece of production for all ETC theaters? What do you think about this, all of you? Yes, certainly, but I think that our friends from uh, VD, they are really a step behind us in this way. Not behind, uh, sorry, beyond. I'm sorry, beyond. they are not behind, they are beyond. beyond. I'm so sorry. Absolutely, and we will, absolutely. And we will um, probably have some more of our friends and the colleagues that we will uh, go on and, and and try also to join them. The, the other thing is uh, in this moment, as uh, uh, Georg Andreas said, uh, we have also this opportunity that uh, uh, European Commission um, made a focus on the green topic and with a lot of money. So uh, the, the problem is in all different countries that we have to catch something for all fields. Uh, this is more difficult, but probably uh, about the buildings and about what we can do, recycling uh, sets, all, all, all things that you, you, you mentioned now, probably we can uh, present some projects to the EU. 
I think it's really important now uh, first to share together the experiences and then to have concrete things and uh, to be able to, to find the way to support and to, to, to have the support of this. Uh, if I can add, this is a very good idea, I think so. If I can add to this new uh, um, Corona budget, Europe can't decide right now because of Poland, Hungary, Hungary, but they will at the end, I'm sure they will find a way to do this. There is a whole envelope about digital transformation of the society. And because this year is digital for sure, I'm sure this is also one of the possibility to get some help and some subventions from Brussels to make a, a, an online digital project but around the theme of going green. Because people certainly, this could be a very nice way to maybe get some money from Brussels to put this issue further. Um, I would also like to um, join, to ask Heidi to join us because we did not talk- Already. Oh, you're already here. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you should also remind us of these sustainable development goals of the UNO we did not really mention today and to go totally in the direction what we're all talking about it. Would you give us a little topic about this? Um, yes, uh, absolutely. And also add to what Serge was saying, because like in the beginning, uh, this is the beginning of a process for us also to look for the expertise, to find uh, the sources and the knowledge that we all need to yeah, transform our work. And uh, I want to thank all the speakers, first of all, because um, we have spent actually quite some time also in finding you um, because it is not um, so obvious to have the expertise around and in digging and uh, going different um, ways, we realize, okay, there is a little bit of knowledge here, a little bit of knowledge there. And uh, in working together with different networks, um, the picture slowly starts to yeah, fall into a larger piece uh, and the puzzle becomes more um, yeah, complete. So therefore, we also uh, intend to continue working on specific subjects and offering workshops in December and in January with NABU and also in relationship and new collaboration with uh, Julie's Bicycle, mm -hmm. another UK based agency um, bringing change in the environment uh, uh, work with theatres. As of next week, we are also a partner in the um, Voices of Culture dialogue with the European Commission to work on cultural organizations and the sustainability development goals. What are the challenges and the opportunities also for us as uh, organizations to bring this change uh, that we've heard uh, in the morning into societies. And I think it's also important in this context to see and to know um, that communities are part of uh, the sustainable development goals, um, identified um, areas where action is actually taking place to enhance yeah, access to infrastructures, to uh, yeah, green future-based uh, creations. And cultural organizations are a very strong part in this whole um, yeah, picture. And for us, it's also important then to see what are the means to sustain, to be sustained, actually, to be part of this uh, sustainable community. And this would be definitely also a future question in our collaboration with NABU to learn from the expertise, from the lobbying side, how can we access those supporting funding schemes, not just on European level, but also on a more national level in all the different um, countries, because every country has signed up to those um, sustainable development goals. And like you said, Annette, we are also collecting the information um, in the ETC network. It will be accessible on our website as a sort of resource center to see what's happening on stage, what can we do, but also what's happening backstage, what are the methods uh, that we need to yeah, adapt to transform our public institutions and to fulfill also our missions towards a sustainable community in a theater, looking at the creative, um, um, components to the administration, to the technical implementations, to the audience outreach, and to formulate or develop within the network also a reflection that can be then applied to our member theatres as a sort of set uh, recommendation, like uh, I think Reith, you've said it, it's 
not really necessary that each individual theater or venue starts to rethink from zero, but that we have a guiding uh, principle that we can apply to our work. And Absolutely. this is also something that we will be uh, yeah, developing in consultation with our members over the coming months while looking for the expertise um, around Europe. Wonderful, a kind of white book that everybody can use and uh, implement in uh, in his own way. I think this is a wonderful idea. I would also restress the idea of a label to think about a, a criterion list of how a theater can go green and have a green label. I think this is, could also be a role of the ETC to think about this because you have uh, so many public theaters as members. Also from my side, I want to thank you very much, all the speakers. It was a very inspiring. I learned a lot of all. I thought that we just think about what could be done. There is already a lot of things done. And I like the bees on the theater in Switzerland. I have to say, this is my personal favorite. It's a little thing, but I love it. Um, also very much again and again to all the colleagues from the, here we come again, Veresh Shandor Sinhad Theater in Sombate. We are really so happy that you joined us at least uh, in, in this way, but also we are again very unhappy that we could not have been with you. All the, the partners from the whole round for the live stream and for the thank yous for the ETC team, I think this is Serge and not me who will do it. Yes, absolutely. We, we, we thank uh, the ETC team because it was one week to the, the other. Last week it was the European Forum and this week it's uh, the GA, so it's a lot of or things in the same time. So, Hélène, uh, Teresa, Alice, uh, Juna, Christy, Heidi, really a, a, a big, uh, I, I thank you very, very much. And also to all our speakers, and obviously, Annette, you are wonderful with so much energy. It's amazing, really. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, let's give us all, let's get, make our all on and give us all together with the phone a round of applause. Yeah, a theater feeling, finally. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I wish you really go green, a fantastic way. I think there are so many things already done, so many inspirational stuff we heard together. I'm sure uh, this is a very good beginning for this marathon who will especially take our lifetime, let's be clear. We will never stop to think about stuff like this. So. It's very nice to have started with you. I say goodbye and I give the final words to Heidi. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Annette. And also another thank you from my uh, side because you've joined us with such an enthusiasm via Zoom and guided also our conversations and preparation to this conference through your professional eyes of a TV journalist who's used to work with a non-visible audience. So that's also something new for us in adapting to the digital change and the impact of the pandemic. So thank you very much. And um, I want to say goodbye as well to our uh, audience um, outside in the live stream. Um, we hope to see you again in one of our next um, conferences in June. And I want to invite our Zoom audience, the ETC members and guests, to stay on for a few more minutes with us as we have prepared a little special treat for you throughout the next days and that we would like to introduce you.